One of the most incredible realities about the Word of God is it doesn't paint an idealistic picture of the way people behaved. It shows people with, as we say, warts and all. It shows people as sinners. It shows people as those who fail, including us, even including our beloved Peter and Paul. It shows them with their failures and their struggles. But in the Old Testament, we sometimes have, in some places, such a reverence for certain things that God has done that we, we just try to make it perfect to the point that, well, these people couldn't have failed, and yet it is absolutely apparent that they did fail. I'm Pastor Tim Holstrom. We're talking about how do you read your Bible? We read it in a plain, normal manner. We're not imposing special rules of interpretation on it. We read it for what it says. And God gave Israel the law. And right now we are looking at the fact of God giving Israel a law as a way of life, not a way of salvation, not a way to become righteous before God, but a way in which to live righteously so that they might approach God, might approach the temple, might approach the tabernacle before that. And the law was to be their righteousness, but the New Testament is very apparent, not before God. So when we're reading this book, we're going to come across this information that's going to make us really think strongly about what did the law actually do. And we saw in the New Testament, I believe in our last study, that Paul says that the law demonstrated that we're all sinners. It demonstrated that we all have a sin problem. And so when we read this over here, we probably should, if we're reading with hindsight from what Paul says, we probably should see this. We're going to take a look at these today. I've got a slew of scriptures I want to move through, and uh, we'll see how fast we can go through these without very little comment. But Deuteronomy chapter 5 to begin with, which we looked at in our last study, where... <clears throat> God has given the law through Moses. Moses is repeating it to Israel a second time, now 40 years after it was first given. And they are just about ready to enter the land. And he says, Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments. This is the way God looks at it. Yes, they said everything that I've asked of them, everything I've told them, they'll do. But he says, Oh, that they really were like that. In other words, he knows they're not. And then we saw Joshua said the same thing. And God's evaluation of them repeatedly is that they fail. So we go back, and I just want to look at some examples of failure. In Exodus chapter 32, just a very short space after Moses comes down the mountain, gives them the initial statements about the covenant summed up in the in the Ten Commandments, and then he goes back up the mountain, and now he's going to get the, the, the remainder of the law. And we read in Exodus 32, 1, Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Notice what, what they said. Make a God for us here. And Aaron said to them, We'll tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. And all the people tore off the gold rings which are in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And they took these from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. I've always wondered about this. Maybe some of you have a thought. Because uh, this is not the only time that we have calf worship, and they seem to always think that this is an acceptable representation of God. But this is your God, and when Aaron and, and when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, "Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord." So the next day they rose early, offered burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drank, and rose up to play. And this word play here has two possible meanings. They've translated play here in the sense like they were just making merry in some sense. And with the idea perhaps that they were laughing because this is related to a word for laughter or is a verb form of the word laughter uh, similar to the name Isaac. But there's also the possibility that there's a part of this word 
that has to do with sexual uh, activity. It's used of what Rebecca and Isaac were doing uh, when uh, the king looked out the window and saw Isaac caressing, they say. Or we might say plain, but plain, plain, you get, you get uh, what I'm saying here. Plain in a way that uh, would be appropriate between a husband and wife. This is what they're doing as people in the worship of this God. And this, if we think this is strange, this is not uncommon. In the worship of the people around them, all throughout that area, that sexual activity was part of their worship activity. So what they're doing, eating and drinking and doing all of this stuff, is part of what they did. But look at this. This is just a short space. They're still at Sinai. They haven't, they have just got the initial thing. They have just made their commitment to this and boom, already. What are they doing? They're already chasing after other gods. And Moses has to go back for the nation. Numbers 14. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried and the people wept that night. Now this is about sending the the 12 spies in, 10 come back and go, we can't take the land, there's no way, they will devour us, those people are giants in the land, and yeah, everything about it is great, except the people are too big. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? You see what they're saying? They're saying, God did this to us. God brought us out here to kill us. That's what they're looking at. Instead of saying, God can give us the land. Caleb and Joshua say, God can give the land to us. But the rest of them say no. They go along with the ten. They're, they rebel. Number 16, a little while after there. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi. So this is one of the Levites. You can go back a little bit before this and you can see what the responsibility of the Kohathites were. They were people that were involved in covering and taking items from the, from the tabernacle when they moved and hauling these things on behalf of the priests. And these people then, it says that that these people then rose up, it says in verse 2, before Moses, together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation. So this isn't just, <coughs> excuse me, this isn't just 250 people. These are 250 leaders that are involved in this, chosen in the assembly, men of renown, and they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You've gone far enough, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is in their midst, so why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? And of course, if you read all of this, Moses says, Okay, well, this is what we do tomorrow. You come present your fire, we'll present ours, and we'll see who God accepts. And God opened the earth and took Kohath, or uh, Korah and all of his family and those people alive down into Sheol. He punishes them because they rebelled. Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Uh, in this situation, it says in verse 8, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron, assemble the congregation, speak to the rock, because they're, they're grumbling that they don't have any water. Speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their beasts drink. And think about this. This is not just a trickle of water out of spring. This, because you've got uh, you've got well over a million people and livestock, this is going to be a substantial amount of water coming out of the rock. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord, just as he had commanded him. And Moses gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of the rock? Moses lifted up his hand, and he struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drank. But God said, Because you didn't believe, or you didn't treat me as faithful, to treat me in this way as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So they grumbled. They complained again that God brought them out there to die. He says, no, I'm going to give you water. He tells Moses what to do. Talk to the rock, but Moses doesn't talk to it. He, he's so angry at the people, he strikes the rock. And so now even Moses himself is not going to have the privilege of leading the sons of Israel across the Jordan into the land. They're grumbling and Moses does not show his show God's faithfulness or his confidence in God. Numbers chapter 25 
In verse 1, it says, While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. Now, if you remember, if we go back in this story, the king of Moab had hired had hired um, Balaam, who was a prophet, to come and curse Israel. But every time Balaam opened his mouth, God made him, caused him to bless Israel. And the king got very frustrated. But, and we don't know this from the Old Testament passage, we know this from the New Testament, that Balaam then told Balak, the king, he says, this is what you do. And this is Tim's paraphrase now. You basically send your really pretty young girls or young ladies up along the border and have them flirt with their young men and they will do anything for them. And so they began to play the harlot. Now, this play the harlot here is exactly what it sounds like because that's what they did. It's both figurative of how they compromise in their worship, but it is also what they're doing as part of their religious worship. For they invited the people to sacrifice to the sacrifice of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods, and Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor, and the Lord was, a, was angry against Israel. You see this? Back in Exodus, the golden calf. We have the rebellion with regard to the spies in the land. We have the rebellion of Korah. We have the, re the grumbling about the water and Moses' disobedience. And we have the people committing adultery here. In fact, this story is great because God actually causes a plague. And Phinehas, one of the sons of Aaron, ends up grabbing a spear and runs in when he sees one of these people just blatantly taking one of the daughters of Moab into his tent, and he knows what they're going to do, and he runs both of them through in one in one thrust with the spear. So you can use your mind to figure out what they were up to at that time when he runs in and runs them through. This is what's taking place. In this, really in reality, to some degree, in a very short space of time. We come now over to the book of Judges. Moses has died. Sons of Israel have entered the land. They've taken a conquest. We're skipping over what happened at Ai uh, uh, there with, uh, with the man that, that takes some items that weren't supposed to be taken. But, we, but the conquest is now done. Joshua is going to die. And it says in Judges 2, 6, And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the territory of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gosh. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, that is, they all died, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served Baals, and they forsook or abandoned the Lord, <coughs> the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt." goes on down a little further in verse 18, and it tells us, And these people would disobey, and when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies. <coughs> Excuse me. All the days of the judge, for the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. And so the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. And he said, because this nation has transgressed my covenant, they're breaking the law, which I commanded their fathers and has not listened to my voice. I also will, will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. So these people are going to be repeatedly disobeying God. Judges chapter 3, verse 7. The sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Judges 4. And the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. And the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoi. Judges chapter 6. 
and the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian for seven years. Judges 8. Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, that is, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a kind of a cough going on, obviously, that is Gideon in accord with all the good that he had done to Israel. So it's, they're not doing what they were supposed to do. They do not remember God. They do not remember who he has used. Judges 10, verse 6, Then the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, served the Baals and the Ashtaroth and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of Ammon. I mean, they're all over the place. And the gods of the Philistines. Thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. And the anger of the Lord burned against them. Judges 13, Now the sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. Then we're going to come to Judges 17. And the chronology stops and we have two events. Some people call this an appendix at the end of the book of Judges. But what happens is, is God is going to have the writers of, of Judges, which I believe was a number of different people that were, recorded these as the events were going on. Because this, is, this does not happen in a short space of time. This is spaced out in over, over, uh, over 200 and some years. And as they're talking about this and writing about these things here, they give two events that went on during this period of time. The first one in Judges 17.1. Now there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, The 1,100 pieces of silver which were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse in my hearing, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Well, blessed be my son by the Lord whether she actually is saying blessed or whether she's saying this kind of tongue-in-cheek as though she's chiding him. He then returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother, and his mother said, I will wholly dedicate the silver from the hand to the Lord for my son to make a graven image. Notice this. I'm dedicating it to the Lord. This is the name Jehovah of the Old Testament. To make a graven image and a molten image. Now, in the in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, it told them they were not to try to do this. They, they were not to make a, goal, uh, a carved image or a molten image. Other places, it says that they were not to try to represent anything because when they saw him, did they see a figure on the mountain that they could make? No, because God does not have that kind of a visage, a kind of a personage that could be seen. So don't try to represent him with an image. But they're going to make a molten image. Now, therefore, I will return them to you. So when he returned the silver to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver, gave them to the silversmith who made them into a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod, that's a, like an apron or a garment here, and, a household, and household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons that he might become a priest. Verse 6, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. They're not following the law. They don't need a king. They just need to go to the law. The law told them what was right, and they're not following the law. And if you read the balance of the story, he meets a Levite, and he says, hey, I'll pay you. I'll take care of you. You become my priest. And he goes, at the end of all this, the Lord was certainly going to bless me now because I have my own priest, which is never the way it was supposed to be. So this man is mixing the kind of stuff that's around them with the other nations with the worship of God, thinking this is okay, but you can't mix the worship of other places with the worship of God. That's not the way it was to be done. So this is an example of how horrible it was and that people thought that this was okay to worship God like this. We come to another hor horrible story. If my wife were sitting here with me, she'd say, I hate this story. We, when we read through the Bible, she does not like this story. It is absolutely horrible, because it's a man about a man by the name uh, or by as a Levite. He's traveling through the country away from where he is, and he has a concubine. Now, concubine, I used to think this was a horrible thing, but this is just like a this is a, kind of like a secondary wife is what it was. But it's a wife of a, of a, of a sense, and they travel through. And the long story short. He ends up in a city uh, in Benjamin, 
And uh, they're just going to spend the night out in the city square. And there's a man there that says, no, 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 no. You don't want to stay in the city square. You come in and stay with me. And that night, the men of the village come and they bang on the door. And they say, bring this man out to us. And essentially, they're going to they're going to perform, a, shall we say, a very violent homosexual acts against this individual. And they won't do it. So you know what they do? They And we look at this and this is unconscionable in us. But they, they put his concubine, they put his wife out there and they let the people ravage her all night. Not in, just horrible. So that in the morning, she's pretty much just about dead. And he cuts her up and sends all the pieces around to the other tribes and all the tribes come together because this is such a horrible thing to happen. And they make war and they decimate one of their own tribes, the tribe of Benjamin. And as my wife said, this is just a horrible story. But again, what's the whole purpose of this story? It's to tell us this is what the people were doing. Why? Because, let's come back. I, I'm trying to, I need to get to the, to the last part of this here. It says in verse 20, chapter 21, verse 25, because this is all kind of follow up with that story. And in those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. This, when people are left to themselves, and they do not resort to the word of God. Now, for them, this was the law. It was just talking about the law. But when they resort to that, people come up with all kinds of things that are acceptable. And you've got the horrible things going on in Benjamin there, the horrible thing that the Levite does with his, with his wife, and all of this, and it's just awful. But you know what? This is what was happening when the people did not obey the law. I'm holding up my whole, this is a whole Bible, but we're talking about the law, which is in part of that. And they weren't obeying that. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Now the sons of Eli. Now Eli is the high priest. His sons are priests, just like Aaron had sons that served as priests under him. But they were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And if you go on and read the rest of this, you can see the horrible things that they did. They didn't follow the rules for how things were to do up there. And they, just to be very not, well, just to be very blunt, they were up there fooling around having sex with the, some of the women up there at the temple or the area where the tabernacle was. This is the stuff that these guys were doing. And they saw nothing wrong with it. But the key thing, they didn't know the Lord. And yet they're serving as the priests. Both of those guys, of course, die because they go off to war and do something that they were not supposed to do. I'm going to skip over Saul and David. I know both of those men did things that were not right. David, of course, or King uh, Saul it, it gets removed from his rule, from his position as ruler because of what he does. Because he essentially steps into the role of the priest, even though he's a king, to offer which he was not supposed to do. And we know what David did in the role of Bathsheba and with her with her husband, how he got him killed. But David acknowledged it. Saul didn't. But for the most part, these men were overall, in God's estimation, is overall they weren't bad. Even though we really throw Saul under the bus, he wasn't nearly as bad as we make him out to be. When you look at the rest of the kings excuse me, of Israel. But I want to go to 1 Kings 11, because this is now David's son Solomon that God has chosen. God has chosen Solomon, just like he's chose Saul. He did, and he chose David. He also chose Solomon. And it says, now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Now God gave them an instruction over in the book of Deuteronomy, when you have a king, because one day you're going to want a king. He's not supposed to multiply wives. But Solomon multiplied wives, and he said he's, they're not supposed to multiply wives because they'll turn the heart away of the king. And he says he had foreign wives along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations, concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after other gods. But Solomon held fast in the, to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away, exactly like God said. And Solomon makes altars and all kinds of things for all these foreign gods. Now, if you kept reading from here, you're going to see some kings of Judah that behave. 
you're going to see a lot of the kings of Israel, they all are out of line. But you're also going to see some kings of Judah that do evil in the sight of God. And that the people are doing evil in the sight of God. And that you have kings that come along and they have to tear down the high places. And they have to tear down all the altars and all these things where the people of Judah are going and worshiping these false gods, even though the kings are trying to do the right thing. Why do, why, why do we drive you down the path looking at this horrible line of behavior? Look at that over there. Look at that over It's because the law, whatever we might think about it, the law was not given to make, ultimately to make Israel righteous. It is, what, as Paul said, the law was given to demonstrate how sinful we are. And trust me, 1,500 years of their history demonstrated for all the world that we're all sinful. sinful. Had God chosen my family and my descendants to be the people that were going to be under that law, we would sadly have behaved the same way. And there are many people that have very high opinions of what they can do and how well they can serve God, but I can guarantee you, we would all fail. So when you listen to people say the law is God's great moral law and it's just the epitome of God's character and it's what we should be doing today, you need to remember Israel didn't do so great following it. They made a mess. They sinned left and right. They abandoned God left and right. And if you try to live by law today, you, and we're not done looking at some of these things, you're likely going to fail. And I'm not trying to make the law look bad. I'm trying to say it did a good job of what God intended it to do, to prove that we're sinners. But, you know, you don't have to focus on the fact that we are sinners by our background and our behavior. You can know that you as a New Testament believer, as a person that has believed in Jesus dying on the cross for your sins, being buried and rising again, that you are now seated in him, that God counts you to be seated in him, and in him you are now made free in Christ. And you can think about that. So that as always, I leave you with the encouragement, have a good day in the Lord, and thank you for joining me.